I really need this one. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you all for coming here in this lovely evening here in this stadium. I, um, I, I can't tell you how happy and honored I am. Are you sitting there as well? Let's, let's do this. Let's see. We'll do that last. So you're here as well. <laughs> Thank you. So I would like to tell the story of my life to you. I, when I was about 17, I wanted to become a pilot. That I, I already went to a, a pilot school, so I was really, my, the perspective of my life, would, I would just stay in the air the rest of my life. But then something happened that my eyes were not good enough. So I was blocked. And that was the first time I really was blocked in my career. And it would happen many times after that. So I had to make another choice. And that's why I went to study physics in University of Delft. And uh, so I, I studied physics for about seven years. But I was not a very good student. And uh, I, it was the hippie time. And in the hippie time, people did not what they were supposed to do. So I was just painting. And I loved uh, drawing very much. And so after seven years of studying physics, I decided to become a painter. And that's what I did for many years. And in then the beginning of the 80s uh, of the last century, I uh, had this idea of making a flying saucer, uh, a big flying saucer which could really fly. And then I launched this, uh, this flying saucer over the town where I uh, lived. And it was a black thing and it hung in the sky. And because it was, the weather was a bit hazy, you couldn't see any depth in there. So it was just a black disc traveling through the sky. And if you don't know how high it is, you cannot estimate how big it is. If you think it's very high, then it's very big and it goes very fast. And that's what the police thought, that it was indeed very big and very high. And well, this uh, interview with the police was on television and I did uh, myself also, I, I filmed the launching of the beast, of, uh, of the UFO, and, and it was broadcasted on television about four days after the launching. Now, this made me famous for a few months in my own country, and uh, I was quite happy with that, but after that I wasn't able to paint anymore, and then I started making machines. So I made a sort of painting machine instead of making the paintings myself, I had a machine to do the paintings. And in the beginning of the 90s, I had a strange idea of making new forms of life. So this strand beast, which came really into uh, my life. And the strand beasts are based on a material uh, which is not very common. As you know, the real nature is made of protein. Our bodies are made of protein. And you could say that the creator, he restricted himself very much in the choice of his materials. He just used protein to make us. And that's what I didn't want to do as well. I want to uh, reject, of, uh, restrict myself very much uh, in the choice of my materials. I just want to use protein. Uh, 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 my protein is a sort of thing I would like to show you. Is this. This is my protein. So I restrict myself only to this kind of tube. And this kind of tube we use in Holland for power lines in houses. So there are electricity lines in here. So it's everywhere on the street and it's very cheap. And I show you how by first 
uh, hobby was developed. Um, let me see. Can you hold, hold this for a minute? This will be the big trick. You are? I, I'll make a sound of it. Thank you. Now we get the tube. So I used to shoot this kind of tube in open windows. Let's see. There it is, thank you. So when I was 11 years old, this was my hobby. So it all started with this kind of tube. And uh, so I would like to show you some video just to get in the mood for the strand beasts. Okay, can we start the movie Mahler? Yes, thank you. Can you have music with it? Okay.
So this is the, the hammer which beats in the pin in the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I would like to explain the leg system of the beasts. And this is a model. Um, could somebody hold my mic? So, and I stand on this side. So, in the middle of each, each animal, there's a sort of spine. And the spine makes a circular movement like this. And you see that the circular movement is transformed to a, a walking movement written by the pencil. I hope everybody can see this. And you may notice that as soon as the pencil is on the ground, it draws a straight line. A straight line, a straight horizontal line. And that means that the animal draws a straight line as well. It stays on the same level. And that's what you have with strand beasts. They don't toss up and down. So they stay on the same level. Normally when you walk, you go up and down, but the strand beasts, they stay on the same level. I would like to show you is the beast which is standing here. Thank you. So it stays on the same level, right? Are you okay? I toss up and down, but the beast stays on the same level. Okay. <laughs> Now, now comes the difficult part of the story, because now I'm going to explain how I came to this leg system. But uh, being uh, a part of the Polytechnic Museum, I assume that you can follow my story. I will make it very simple for you. The, the fact... Yes, please. The fact that uh, the animal doesn't toss up and down is... Uh, caused by the shape of this curve written by the pencil. So it moves like this is a straight line, lifts up, straight line, and the shape of this curve is very much depending on the length of the tubes between the spine and the pencil. If you have enough of the proportion of length, then the pencil will move in a totally different curve. And when I started this, I didn't know which proportion of length I needed to get the shape of this curve. And that's why I wrote a com computer program uh, in an Atari computer. You may know what an Atari computer is. It was in, in the 90s, 80s, was, you had Atari computers. And so the computer, it could uh, uh, generate this curve, but still, you have a lot of possibilities. There are 13 lengths of tubes which determine the shape of this curve. And uh, if the Atari would let pass all the possibilities, it would be on for 100,000 years. There are so many combinations, and it's not easy to find the right combination. That's why I had to use the principle of evolution in this process. So there were born 1,500 of these legs in the computer. Oh, Oops. sorry about that. 1,500 legs were born in the computer, but they were all different. They had different lengths of tubes. So you, you get also, also 1,500 different shapes of written by the pencil. And none of them is this shape. The chance is very little. And uh, so, there, but there are some of these curves which look a little bit like this curve with the flat bottom. And those are selected by the computer. 
and the rest of the, the legs dies, is extinct. So there's a selection which is alive, and that selection has the privilege to multiply. And that means that the tubes are copied and reassembled to 1500 new combinations, which you can see as the children of the selection. Now this process of selection and reproduction went on for months, day and night, and there came out 30 numbers out of the computer which I could use to build the system. And then it practically, it worked. The animals didn't toss up and down. Now, in fact, you could see this, the, the animals are running more than 20 years on just a combination of numbers. And you could see these numbers as a, a DNA code, the DNA code of the strand beasts. I published this DNA code on my website already a long time ago. And since then, lots of students in the whole world are producing strand beasts. So they make them in wood, in aluminum, there are schools, there are projects. And so the, the students have the idea that they have a new hobby and that they are very happy. But in fact, they are abused by the strand beast for reproduction. So they, the strand beast, they use, they infect students with their DNA codes and they use the students for reproduction. So everywhere in the world, you'll find small strand beasts and they don't survive very well on beaches, but they survive better in a habitat of student rooms on bookshelves and say so they have their own way of surviving. So since a few years, this uh, reproduction of the strand beast, they just, they, so they can really multiply, went into an acceleration uh, because there came two students to my studio and they had a, a cardboard box with them. I will pick it up, just a minute. Clean up a little bit. This was the box. This came out. And I hope... <laughs> Well, and they said, thank you, this, they said, this beast, which you see here on the table walking, is not assembled. It's born. Born? Yes, it was born in a 3D printer. And I did, I did know about the existence of 3D printers, but I didn't know you could make moving parts with it. And this is a very special printer which uh, spreads out a thin layer of nylon powder and then a laser melts some parts together in a pattern and then a next layer of nylon powder goes over it and again the laser melts some parts together so layer by layer it spreads out the nylon powder and it ends up with a box a box full of nylon powder and the beast is in there. So you just have to, to blow off the nylon powder and it runs over the table. Now imagine, imagine what happens now after four and a half billion years of evolution, we happen to be born in a period that evolution took a side way because these animals, they can put their DNA code, which are zeros and ones, you can put them on the internet, and everywhere in the world, you can print out these animals. And they uh, can also be combined, so you can combine two animals on both sides of the world, 
and you get a new animal. So this is, I hope you realize what junction of time we are born, four and a half billion years, and we are here reproducing in a totally different way. What you see here on this table is in fact a mutant. It's a mutant uh, because it doesn't have my DNA code. This is done by a guy in Amsterdam, a friend of mine, and he made his own DNA code. And I must say, it works quite nicely. So it might have more children than my DNA code. And what you can see on the internet, what is going to happen here is that you get an evolution of the, uh, the student room strand beasts. Because they, the older you get, this mutation gets other muta mutants. And so it will be an evolution of little strand beasts like this, a 3D born printed. I, for fun, I will show you another one because in my eyes it was really a miracle that this exists. You can see it. So very small, too small to, to uh, well, later when you have time, you can still come forward and we can look personally at the, at the small 3D printed beast. In the meantime, I think I'm going to show you just a little bit more video. Can I show the one step? Yeah. So here you see just a development, how it works. So in October, I always start with a new animal. And in spring, it's half finished. And then I take it to the beach and do all kinds of experiments on the beach. And then it becomes the fall. And then I declare the animal extinct. So it will be pushed on the boneyard. And I, I gained a lot of new knowledge during the summer, which I can uh, use in the next animal, which I start again in October. Now, all these uh, extinct animals, they end up in exhibitions. So what you see at the exhibition here in Moscow is that uh, it are all fossils. And for the exhibition, we can reanimate the fossil by I tell that later why, how we are gonna do that. First, I have to tell something about the nerval system of the beast. So, uh, would you assist me? I would like to show you something. So, we're talking about nerves. Uh, sir, would you hold this? 
So everybody can see it? Yes, wonderful. Hey. Oh, thanks. So what happens here is a small O-ring on the end of this tube. And in fact, you have a piston here. Now, these pistons are connected to the wings. So when you see the wings moving, they are pumping air. They are pumping air in lemonade bottles, in soda bottles, water bottles, to high pressure. And this pressure the animals can use for all kind of purposes, like walking on the fluffy sand, or uh, sensing purposes. On the other hand, if you connect this tube with a bottle, then this comes out. <laughs> so, in fact, what you have here is a sort of muscle. And muscles turn out to be very handy if you want to survive on beaches. And, uh, this muscle is uh, a pushing muscle. We have pulling muscles, and this is a pushing muscle, and I could say that this is a, a, a mixture of a muscle and a bone. In fact, we don't have separate bones, the bone and the muscle is the same thing, which in fact is a better muscle than we have. When you open a valve here, then this jumps out, so the valve you can see as a nerve cell. Our nerve cells trigger our muscles by electricity, pulses. Here's just opening a valve. I have a valve here. And I hope that you all can see this. This is the valve. So if I blow in air in here, The air? the air goes in here and comes out of here. Goes in here, comes out of there. But if I push in this piston here... It's blocked. It's blocked. And so this is nothing but a valve. Open, close. Now, this valve can you be uh, triggered by air. So, if I blow air in here... Then the valve is closed. So, if air goes in here, no air comes out of here. Oh, this is really a lesson for you. If this is the output and this is the input, the output is opposite from the input. Yes? I will make it very clear for you. If you see this as, as if you see this as a person, and sorry, I need you. <laughs> you hold this. Uh, if you see this as a person, and this is the mouth and this is the ear, the mouth says the opposite from what it hears. Okay, I'm going to start there. So if you see this as a person, and this is the mouth, and this is the ear, the mouth says the opposite from what it hears. So that's clear, right? So that's why I call this a liar. It says the opposite from what it hears, which makes it easy, right? A liar. I'm a liar. So. We're going to do an experiment now uh, with uh, somebody from the audience. Let's see. Yes? Ah, oh, we had a volunteer. Okay. And we have another volunteer, maybe? Your, your boyfriend? No? Yes. Yeah, no, okay. So, <laughs> he doesn't want. Oh, no, okay. So, if you are a liar, yes. and you are a liar, and I'm a liar, we're going to do this experiment. So I say to you, yes, you are a liar. You hear yes. What would you say to him? Yes, I am a liar. 
it's not easy to lie for you, right? So if I say yes, you, yes comes in your ear, so you say the opposite from what you hear. What would you say to him then? I am a liar. Yes, I am a liar. <laughs> It's not easy for you to lie, right? Okay, no, I'm not a liar. Yeah, yeah. Right? She said no. Yes, you hear yes and you say no. You hear no and you say? <laughs> no, you say yes, I'm a liar. No. You don't have to say you're a liar or not. Just say yes or no. So I say yes to you. You say no to him. You hear no. And what you say to me? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, he says... Uh, yes, and I say, I hear yes, and I say, niet to you, I right? Da, yeah, right? <laughs> da, yeah, niet, da. The, the next step niet. is opposite, opposite to previous. That's right, that's right. Well yes, very well. So that's what you have with an un. So in this conversation of three liars, I changed my opinion. So at first I started with yes, and after this conversation, I said no. And that's what you have with an uneven number of liars. With two liars, you keep saying yes, no, yes, no, niet, da, niet, da. With three liars, you keep changing. You have a, a so-called dynamic system. Okay. Yes? yes? Well, thank you very much. I have I have three liars here. So this is you, and this is you, and this is me, and let's see what the liars have to say to each other. So they're saying yes and no all the time. You have a so-called dynamic system. So you were in this, you were involved in this dynamic system. We have the same conversation with these liars. And as you know, you can say a yes as a one and a no as a zero. In fact, what you see here, ladies and gentlemen, is the beginning of the brain, which can switch zeros and ones, just like in a computer. So this is the future of the strand beasts. It are the nervous system and the brains of the strand beast. And as you all know, brains are a very handy tool to survive. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here, right? Now, with these brains, these animals take all their decisions. So what I see in the future, uh, how the animals would survive, is now that they have two kinds of lives. They have a life on the hard sand and a life on the soft sand. They are only on the hard sand when the wind is parallel to the beach. So imagine they are standing on the hard sand and the wind is parallel to the beach, it walks along the beach and until it can't f f go further anymore because there's a harbor or anything, so they walk a distance along the beach and then they stand on the soft sand and they have to wait on the soft sand for the wind to turn 100, 180 degrees, which might take a few weeks. So they have a long life on the soft sand. In the meantime, when they're on the soft sand, they should uh, fight against the storms, also fight against the upcoming water. And then there comes this moment that is low water and the wind is indeed uh, turned 180 degrees. Then they decide with their own brains to go with their ski sticks over the soft sand and they catch the wind on the hard sand and they're going to travel back again to the original place. So it will be migration animals. And they can only walk on the soft sand using a sort of ski sticks, which are a sort of pumps 
and you can, if you come to the museum or go to, to the, the venue, then you will see how the animals can walk with the pumps to on the soft sand. On the hard sand, they just are pushed by the wind. Well, living on the soft sand, they need a certain uh, senses. So they need senses for the wind, the, str the strength of the wind, but also direction of the wind. And uh, I brought here the, uh, the water feeler for you. This is the water feeder. I need some assistance. <laughs> yes, my charming assistant. <laughs> and another assistant who is holding. So I would like you to hold it here. Now, this tube is uh, vital for surviving on the beach. It's feeling the water. It sucks in air all the time. And as soon as the sea comes up, it swallows the water and it feels the resistance of the water. And then the animal should do something. The first place, it should walk away for the water. And the other thing is, it should uh, start a time mechanism. A time mechanism is a sort of alarm clock which runs off after five hours. After five hours, it will be low tide, so the animal knows there will be a big plane of hard sand in front of him on the beach. If that information is combined that the wind is northeast, so it can go with his ski sticks to the hard sand and decides to, go to migrate to the other place again. Now, uh, we're going to try to use the, the water feeler and see if it works. It works only in 50% of the cases, but it's improving uh, in the years. Let's see. Uh, so I would like to, to put a glass of water, uh, put this in a glass of water, and then there should happen something. And what should happen is I put the, the liars on the water feeler. So if I put it in a glass of water, then you should hear the liars running. Yeah, you're convinced? I'm not. <laughs> Let's see if we have some water, a glass of water. And we need the liars. It's amazing. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> you okay? Yes. So many things to do here. Oh, there's a microphone. Let's see where I put it. I put it here. So, you can go, let go this one. Now, it's going to move in your hands, and it's a sort of heartbeat. So, mm -hmm. and one time I put it in the, oh, there's still water in there. Yes, it needs to go out, otherwise it feels the water already. So, let's see. Yes, so first you have to open something. Nothing happens. No. Maybe there is uh, water inside? No, it's uh, something else. It is. Come on. Come on, please. Now comes to see, <laughs> does it react? <laughs> that was not real. I'm sorry, it didn't work. Well, I said 50%, but so it didn't happen tonight. I'm sorry.
but it should. Give me another 10 years and it will be working. If, in fact, I'm working on another water feeder which works in a totally different way. It just sucks in some water and presses it again. And since water is, you cannot press water in, then of course the animal knows it's water. And if it's air in there, it, you can press it in. So that would be uh, a water feeler which may function better. So let's do a short uh, Q&A. So if, if people have a question, we can do several uh, questions about the strand beast and maybe after that, I don't know how much time do I still have. Ivan, how much? No problem. The Q&A, right? Yes. So do we have a mic and do we have the ladies? Yes, we have the mic. Mic and ladies, that's what you need, yeah. And uh, then we have the ladies, yes. And somebody should raise a hand and ask a question, okay? Uh, not everybody, well, there's a, there's a lady wishing to ask a question. Oh, no, one by one, one by one, please. The, the lady on the... On no, the, there's a, we have okay. to pass the mic first. Uh, can you share, please, with us, how did you come to this idea of creation of this beast in the first place? So what was the main push, let's say, for that? Okay. So I used to be a writer for a, a newspaper, so I, every, every week I has to, have to write uh, a column. A column about crazy ideas which I had. And I had this idea once to write a column about was like... Uh, structures on the beach which would gather sand on wind power and build up dunes. So it makes the dunes higher for the rise of the sea level because as you know, may know my country is very low so there's always a threat of the sea. So it, and after that nothing happened for a long time and then I passed this tool shop and I bought some of these tubes and then I played with the tubes for a, an afternoon and I had seen so many things in that afternoon that at the end of the afternoon I decided I would spend one year on the tubes and that was in 1990 and I was really getting this virus in my head which never got out anymore and I uh, I couldn't sleep anymore. I just wanted to think of tubes. Uh, so that's how it all came. Any other question? Uh, I wonder if you're planning to make your creatures or forms evolve into something even more complex or regional. I wonder which will be the next step in their evolution. Thank you. Well, the, the, the next step an evolution which I'm working on right now is fighting the storms. The storms have been quite destructive the last few years, uh, so they, you have to dig the animals out and, uh, and, and everything breaks. So I designed this year that the, the, a sort of nose of the beast which has the shape of a spoiler. And it, it has an uh, and a wing upside down. So when there's, it, when, then there's a storm, the animals should direct their nose straight into the wind. So if the wind is coming from that side, the, uh, the spoiler is pushed down to the ground. And there are all pins there, which will anchor the beast, and the animal will hide itself behind his own nose. So. It, I, I made the shape and I, I covered the whole nose and I put all bottles in there to give it more shape. And we'll see in October if that really worked. It probably worked only for 50% of the cases, but it gives some hope for the, the year after that. So the storms are the next sub subjects. Uh,
Очень интересно. У меня такой вопрос. Когда вы создавали своего лжеца, сердца вашего робота, ой, зверя, вы пытались повторить идею транзистора? Yes, I think I think I understand your question. So it's that I use the principle of a transistor in there. Uh, so in fact, what you can do with electronics, you can also do with liars. And uh, so you can build logic networks just like in a computer. And uh, it, it's in fact it, the only thing. The difference is that normally you have electrons going through there, and now it's air which goes through there. So you can make a, a, some kind of uh, not or or logic in your beast. Yes, yeah? there are uh, gates in there as well. So or gates and and gates. All that kind of thing is there. Uh, so you build in your beast, uh, plan in it in a transistor way, yes? Yes, yes, oh. yes. Okay, it's the brain. brain. Okay. okay. Yes? Uh. You showed us an example of a small model that students had made. And I wonder, given the possibilities of production, especially at the nano level, is it possible to reproduce some of these systems on a tiny scale? Well, it, it, the, a nano level, level, that would be something. I'm talking about your, your neural networks in particular. Oh, the neural networks. Well, I think the neural networks is not really something new. In fact, I think, especially here in Russia, the, the first computers, they were pneumatic. And uh, they, they were built, I think, here in Moscow. And so that was the first, what I'm doing, in fact, I'm imitating the first Russian uh, computers. It's all based on that logic. And so it's obviously, you cannot make it as small as the, the real electronics at the moment, because you cannot beat the, the memory, uh, which has, a, has a, the modern electronics. I give it up now already to try to beat it that. But the brain of the beach animals are very small. They don't have to be big. They just need to react on outer uh, uh, senses, like water, wind, sand, all those kind of things they have to react on. And very simple reactions will make this animal survive on the beaches. That's what I'm thinking of. So you don't need a computer to do this, just very simple nerve cells, small wires will help this animal survive. Okay. Hello. Моя дочка, которая 6 лет, очень просила передать вам привет. Она ваш абсолютный фанат. И э, после просмотра ваших роликов на YouTube, э, некоторые мои друзья, в том числе и физики, сказали, да, это круто, это супер здорово, это гений инженерной мысли, но это абсолютно бесполезно. Я хотела опровергнуть эту точку зрения, потому что я уверена, что ваши работы могут успешно использоваться э, для лечения психосоматических расстройств, а также для детей с диагнозом аутизм. И потому что здесь есть две главные составляющие, это... Uh, суперинженерная мысль, творчество и чудо. И мой вопрос был таков, uh, занимались ли вы арт-терапией, участвовали ли в каких-то проектах, помогающих uh, детям с аутичными чертами? Вот, спасибо. Спасибо за вопрос. Well, what's... In fact, I don't know how this all works, that... Um, what... The effects sometimes on, of the, my animals on people is that they start smiling. And I don't know how I did that. But it obviously, it, it's an effect which I can watch and that I see. And at the same time, it puts some uh, task on my shoulders to show my work to the, to the world. I mean, If I'm so lucky that I'm an artist who is understood by even small children and also people with disorders in their minds, then of course 
I have a, I have a task on my shoulders to show it to the world. And uh, so it, the, the effect is that it makes people smile and happy, which makes me happy, of course, very much. And it stimulates me, of course, with my work on the beach to make the new development, but also to do exhibitions just like here in the venue in Moscow. I hope this is an answer, for, answer to your question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, amazing to see you. Um, two parts. You said you were a painter first and an artist. Um, you, were you trained in school and, um, for that? And how long did you paint for? What, what kind of painting did you do and drawings? What was your favorite kind of paintings? I don't dare to say. <laughs> it are beautiful women and uh, with hardly clothes on. So it's, it, I must say the, the subject was quite vulgar. But I was quite successful selling my paintings. And that, uh, so it, it was not the way you think it was. I was not uh, painting beautiful nature or something, beautiful landscapes, no. It were ladies. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I just want to know, I mean, how much do you feel um, your art, the artistic part of you do you feel like that coincides and correlates like art and science as one? You know, like, do you feel, in, do you feel like the artistic training that you had has inspired this kind of work? Does that make sense? By the paintings, you mean? No. Yeah, like, no. you, like, how did, like... Well, the paintings was just a period in my life. Well, of course, people ask me, are you an, an artist or are you a scientist? And I must say, I don't know what I am. And in fact, the, the, the question is quite trivial when you're on the beach, when I'm, sometimes I'm just all alone on the beach and there will be big clouds over me and the sea and questions like I'm an artist or a scientist don't matter at that moment. I feel more like an Eskimo, something and Eskimos do a lot of artwork without knowing what a museum is. And so I would like to forget all the institutions which put a label on people from you're an artist and you're a scientist. I feel more like an Eskimo. And it's uh, that I, um, was, I wanted to say something, but I now forget. <laughs> uh, so I, I was an Eskimo, but... <laughs> Oh, I, I will remember later, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hello? Yes? Hello? Over here? Over here? To the left. To the left. To the left? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much for presentation. Yes. Hello. Uh, uh, yeah. Can I... Um, yeah, he's just a minute, sorry. My, um, it's fascinating how uh, unnatural things can be uh, combined into something natural and beautiful like this. Um, have you ever thought of um, doing this for and, and not uh, making profit on it? And my kind of question on it is how you uh, make a living of your works. Because I think everybody is... Um, Curious. Um, yes. Fascinated by your works, but also curious how you can spend such a beautiful life uh, and just uh, making this. Mm -hmm. So the finances. So, so well, in the in the nineties, I must say that I survived on the Dutch government. So you, in the Dutch, in Holland, you have a system that you can apply for artists. You have to to fill in the form to tell a story and then you send it to the, to the government and they give you a scholarship. And that's what I have for many years. So that's how I financed my children. And after that, I started earning money with it because I sell small models which you can assemble yourself. And I also, for exhibitions, people pay money to get in. They do that. 
And so that's I survive on, lec on lectures like this. So I travel uh, sometimes to strange parts in the world and pay pe people pay me for it. <laughs> it's strange, but I feel happy, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I have uh, two questions. Uh, once I found on the internet that you are working on a project of memory of the beasts. So they could know where is the water and where should they go. Uh, could you please explain how it works? And the second question, have you ever heard of works uh, uh, of Charles Babbage who made uh, mechanical computer and uh, maybe have you used these ideas in your work? Uh, well, the first question is how can they navigate on the beach, right? So imagine that the animal is walking over the hard sand to, uh, to the north, so this way. There's the sea and there's the land and they walking parallel to the beach. So the, at the end, they have a sort of tail. So that's the new animal, which is now on the beach. It has a tail which wags up and down. And every time it beats on the sand and it feels the hardness of the sand. That works with two little pins, which uh, can be pushed in on the hard sand, but on the soft sand, nothing happens. If, if it beats on the hard sand, they push, they're pushed in and something leaking at the end, and the animal knows it's hard sand. So it corrects its course a little bit more to the soft sand, and then it feels soft sand again, because away from the soft sand. So it, the, the idea is that they walk uh, on, the, on the mixture between hard and soft sand, so they walk parallel to the beach. Now, now they must know how far they walk. So there's a, a little pump, which I showed you before, is connected to one of the legs. So with every step, it pumps a little amount of air into a soda bottle. So you can imagine while walking, the pressure goes up into that bottle, and at a certain extent, it exceeds a certain level, and then it knows it has arrived in Kaitan, which is a little bit more south, and then it goes with the ski sticks to the soft sand, waiting for the wind to turn south again. That's the idea. So that's how they navigate. Yes?